Welcome, you happy warriors. Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, endeavor to reveal how the world really works. Thank you so much for being part of the show, and thank you for all you do in promoting the show. Uh, I uh, I have an obsessive preoccupation with our numbers, uh, how many people are listening and how many people are downloading, and I can tell when you have been telling friends about it, when you've been giving people the URL or the connection, uh, because the odds are that uh, if I like something, well, then probably my friends would probably be most likely to enjoy it as well. So I appreciate that very much indeed, because I, just, I love seeing those numbers climb. It means a lot to me and gives me um, a higher level of excitement in doing the show, and I appreciate that. Um, you happy warriors, happy because that is a decision we make. Uh, we realize that uh, inflicting the people with whom we live and with whom we work with misery and gloom and pessimism um, is cruel and uh, it's immoral. We have no right to do it, and there's no reason why you have to do it. You can make yourself into a happy warrior, and that means you're pleasant to be around. It means people like working with you. It means people like living with you. People just like being around you, because happiness is contagious just as misery is contagious. And so uh, thank you for being happy and uh, a happy warrior, because there is a constant fight. There's a constant fight to be optimistic, even when there's bad news, to be optimistic even when things are looking tough around you, being optimistic when you are beset by challenges that translate into worries, and still to be cheerful, to be optimistic, and to throw ourselves into the struggle with enthusiasm and with vigor and with determination. No diffidence, no hesitation, but determination, confidence, and knowing that you are going to pull through. And so uh, life at its best is a fight, a challenge, a struggle, and uh, doing so in a state of happiness, well, that makes you a happy warrior. It gives you much greater chance of success, and it means that your journey through life will not only be more successful, but it'll also be more pleasant as you uh, collaborate and work with people around you. I want to start off um, with, a, uh, with some light uh, material before we go on to some of the heavier stuff. Uh, we'll be touching again on China and Taiwan as I did last week, not because I'm trying to make you miserable, heaven forbid, and nothing could be further from my mind, uh, but simply because I want you to be able to take what comes with equanimity, to be prepared for it, to be aware that these things are happening, and nonetheless to remain focused on your five F's. Now, if you're a very new uh, listener to this show, you may not know what your five F's are. And uh, that would be a very good reason to go to my website, rabbidaniellappin.com, and uh, you'll get to it right over there. You'll see it. Uh, that's what you'll see show up. And uh, look for... Um, the Holistic You. That's a free book which uh, we will send to you to, for you to download. And uh, The Holistic You emphasizes the idea that, number one, nobody cares more about your life than you do, or maybe your mother does, but no one else. You care more about your life than anyone else. And what is more, your life is divided into five fundamental uh, core areas. 
and the way I like to lay them out is on five equidistant points on the circumference of a circle. You can draw it. Just put down five equidistant points around the, cu the edge of a circle. If you are detail-oriented and enthusiastic about geometry, well, there's a way of making five equidistant points on a circle with nothing but a compass and otherwise just do it approximately, and then put in your five Fs. The order doesn't matter at all. Your faith, because even those of us who don't know it actually do need faith. You know, it's like uh, somebody who is totally unaware that he needs vitamin D. He's never in the sunshine, doesn't know anything about it. Uh, and the fact that you don't know about it, and the fact that the word vitamin D means nothing to you, doesn't mean you don't need it. Your life will be improved if you go on a vitamin D regimen. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an important thing. You have to have it in your body in the right quantity. Uh, faith is a lot like that. A lot of people don't know anything about faith, certainly don't suspect they need it, even look down on people who have faith. And uh, it's a mistake. I would just recommend you to be really open-minded about this. Put aside all your ancient prejudices, um, get rid of all your primitive preconceptions, and, and just try a little of my exercises on faith. It is a huge improvement to the quality of life. So uh, faith is one of the Fs. Then you put down friendship, uh, and then you put down finances, and then you put down uh, uh, fitness, and, uh, and then you put down family. So those are your five Fs, family and friendships, faith, finances, and fitness. And then you might want to draw straight lines between each of the five points so they all joined up to each other. And uh, don't be in any way bothered by, uh, by what emerges. It looks like a pentagram. Oh, the pentagram, the, the, the uh, black magic, the dark. Just don't worry about all that superstitious nonsense. Um, uh, it is actually a shape uh, that Leonardo da Vinci used to uh, represent the shape of the human body. It doesn't matter what the shape is, though. The important point is we're trying to show you that each one of your five Fs is connected to each of the others. So uh, pop over to rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, uh, look for the holistic you, and uh, you will have that sent to you very quickly, a crucially important part of maintaining uh, the quality of your life and enhancing it in all those areas. Yes, finance, a very important part of it. So all of that is uh, at rabbidaniellappin.com. You look for a book called The Holistic You. It's a download, it's an ebook, and uh, and you get it. So the reason I talk about China and Taiwan is because it's probably going to be one of the next uh, major geopolitical crises, and I just want you to to realize it. It makes no difference. You you carry on with your five Fs. You don't get. Uh, uh, stampeded into into a bad action or a foolish action. Um, you don't get intimidated and frightened by the, the new conditions. Uh, all of the five Fs can um, benefit, can advance, can improve, even with a geopolitical crisis going on. And uh, I also want you to be prepared for what will be, uh, as I've explained, um, breathtaking inaction on the part of the U.S. government. Look, um, the United States is in a downward trend right now, no question about it. <clears throat> it doesn't bring any of us any pleasure to observe it, but uh, it would be sheer foolishness for us to dismiss that. Um, I saw an article recently uh, in a magazine um, I'll, I'll, shall I, I'll tell you the name of the magazine. It was called Commentary Magazine. And there was an article that said, yes, China's getting very strong, but don't you worry, because history shows that democracies always beat totalitarian regimes. And I think to myself, who wrote this? Uh, a particularly um, uh, precocious nine-year-old or an 11-year-old? I mean, who who believes that sort of stuff? 
democracies will always beat totalitarian regimes. Yeah, it's true after the terrors and agonies of World War I and the agonies of World War II and the massacres of World War II. Yeah, it's true. The democracies did eventually win over Germany, but they never won over Russia, really. They haven't beaten out socialism. And this, that's number one, this, this childlike faith in, oh, democracy will do it. Really? You sure? And in any event, uh, are you also confident that America is indeed a functioning democracy? I don't think so. The, the notion that we're one nation under God and that we resolve our differences at the, with ballots, not bullets, it's all very nice, but it isn't true. I mean, just look at the way that differences are being resolved on the streets of major cities since last summer and since the uh, uh, and and since the trial of the policeman in Minneapolis Derek Chauvin and his um, being found guilty and then soon the uh, the verdict will be and yeah no we we, we don't agree on anything um <clears throat> the way dem- justice is supposed to work is not <clears throat> that the mob says we want justice no justice no peace and what they mean by that is probably the death penalty or something like, you know, something close to that. So, um, no, they don't want justice. They want it to come out their way. A functioning democracy right now? I don't think so. Corruption at all levels, a deep state, half the country um, having no confidence in the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Uh, no, we're not a democracy. And if we were... That is what will beat uh, the totalitarian regime such as China? No, that's that's simply not true. Uh, While America continues to bleat and babble about climate change, China, as I've told you, builds a new coal-fired power station every day. Between three and four hundred a year are opening up. The numbers are absolutely incredible. A few weeks back, when I did a show on Bitcoin, I told you about the uh, relative aluminum production capacity of America and China. I'm sorry, my friends, but those are the numbers that matter, not vapid nonsense like, oh, we're a democracy and democracies always win. I mean, what nonsense. And so, sorry, Commentary Magazine, I've been a subscriber for a long time, but uh, I don't think I'm going to be continuing. That's just silliness. And uh, look, uh, you, you've got a lot of very good writers and a lot of excellent articles, but it's it's uh, that that's a waste of time and money to put out an article like that. Uh, democracies will always win? No, uh, not even close to it. So uh, um, why, why am I telling you all that? Because... Uh, I just want you to know why I do talk about China and Taiwan and why I will talk about China and Taiwan. And um, then I also want to tell you about a a French diplomat, a remarkable man um, uh, called Alexis de Tocqueville. And he wrote a wonderful book called Democracy in America. And people quote it all the time. Uh, They're also fairly popular quotes said to be from there, but which I've never found in the book. Uh, but any, you know, Democracy in America is a, a good book and uh, two volumes written by Alexis de Tocqueville. While he was in the middle of writing that, he wrote another small book. Um, he wrote it essentially about the welfare uh, industry. He wrote it about poverty. Uh, he called it pauperism. And he said, what happens when a country builds an administrative structure to take care of the poor, uh, it is one of the most amazing things I've ever read. It's short, it's like 75 pages, a uh, short thing to read, pauperism, and I'll tell you more about that. That was written in 1835, and um, uh, it is frighteningly prescient. Uh, when I read sections of it to you as to what kind of society a uh, a welfare culture would build, you see that he wrote it in 1835, 
but it's describing life in America in 2021. It's describing life in Germany. It's describing life in the United Kingdom. All these uh, countries with huge, big welfare operations. And uh, he also asks a wonderful question, which is why do we find so many more of the population on welfare in successful countries, I was going to say democracies, like uh, the United Kingdom and like the United States, than you do in, shall we say, Ghana? I mentioned Ghana just because it's a country I've, I've come to know and like. And, um, and in Ghana, th there's no huge welfare industry. You don't find large portions of the population sitting home and getting paid money by the state, which is like saying out of tax money, which is like saying by their fellow productive citizens. Uh, so why is it Bangladesh doesn't have a big, huge welfare population receiving uh, what they want in order to live from their fellow citizens. But United Kingdom, Sweden, United States, very large proportion of the population is uh, on welfare. So he asks this question back in 1835, does de Tocqueville, why is it that successful countries that have created wealth seem to have a bigger welfare population? Uh, a bigger population of the poor. All right, those are some of the things that uh, we're going to look like, uh, look at. But let me start off um, talking about a, a name you know of, and um, and I'm going to point out that he was Jewish, particularly because although you know I don't think he was an exemplary person and he shouldn't be anyone's hero or anything like that, but he was Jewish, and because I speak a lot about Jewish principles of wealth creation. I talk a lot about money and finance through the lens of ancient Jewish wisdom. Um, I would like to point out uh, some of the things that this man um, did. His name was Joseph Pulitzer. You've heard of the Pulitzer Prize for journalism and art and music and so on. Um, well, you know, a great idea when he, when he set that up uh, as part of his philanthropy, um, and I think it was after he passed away, it was set up according to his will. Um, you know, it was a great idea. But today it's just become another way of giving medals to leftists, right? to unrepentant secular socialists. Uh, that's for the most part what the Pulitzer Prize has become. Doesn't matter. It's, it certainly wasn't the way he planned it. But uh, I tell you, about Joseph Pulitzer, because I want to tell you about a remarkable woman who worked for him as a journalist in one of his uh, publications, The New York World. It became one of the most successful newspapers in the whole world. But let's start off with Joseph Pulitzer, who uh, uh, grew up, born and grew up in Hungary. His family lost all its money. Uh, they were originally well off. And uh, by the time he was a young teenager, they were literally destitute. And uh, uh, because the, the mother wasn't able to support the whole family, he uh, went off and joined droves of, of other people uh, of, of all backgrounds who were emigrating to America. And uh, he arrived as a 17-year-old boy, 17 years old. He arrives in Boston in uh, 1840, no, not 1847. He arrives in Boston in uh, 1864. He arrives in Boston in 1864, and, um, and he starts immediately. Uh, the very first thing he does, he, he finds out that if you enlist in the army, and he specifically joined the Lincoln Cavalry uh, right after arriving penniless in Boston, and he, uh, he, he discovers they pay a $200 enlistment fee. So he gets $200 in his pocket right away, and then he, he serves in the, the Lincoln uh, Cavalry for a period of time, and um, uh, he, he, by the way, he arrived not knowing English. He could speak uh, German, Hungarian, and French 
didn't even know English. So what principle of ancient Jewish wisdom did he apply right there from day one? And uh, the answer is you straight away find work doing anything. It doesn't matter. Right? It's not a guy who wanted to be in the army, but you do anything in order to start making some money, no matter how little, no matter doing what, but you absolutely have to move from the ranks of the do-nothings to the ranks of the productive. And so he does that, doesn't like it at all, obviously, but uh, eventually um, he uh, he gets out and then he goes to work uh, in Massachusetts in the whaling business, anything to make a few dollars. Um, then he came to uh, New York uh, came back to New York, and he heard that there were a lot of German people in St. Louis. So he uh, rides a boxcar. I mean, he's got no money. He rides a boxcar from New York to St. Louis, where he connects up with the, the huge German population in St. Louis. Now, what principle of ancient Jewish wisdom is this young Jewish boy using here? Connection connection. You've got to connect with people. In this case, he could have chosen to connect with the Jewish community in New York. He chose, he probably felt more identity as a German than as a Jew, honestly, but uh, he still, he still possessed these permanent principles of, uh, of how it's best to function. So he goes off to, um, St. Louis and he finds work there, works very hard and starts um, studying. Okay, that's the third principle of ancient Jewish wisdom. Self-improvement. Develop new knowledge, develop new abilities, develop new skills. And uh, he actually studies law by himself, sitting in the library after work every night. He actually uh, becomes somewhat knowledgeable about law. And then he uh, gets a job, interestingly enough, um, with a law firm. He's not a lawyer, but he gets a job recording deeds for a railway. Um, Jay Gould is building railways across the country, and they need to record the deeds in every county that the railroad is passing through. So it's grueling, laborious, repetitive work. It didn't matter. Uh, to Joseph Pulitzer. He worked like uh, like anything. He really, really worked. And uh, these people are so impressed and he's building connections and they like him and they trust him. And so eventually um, they help him actually become a lawyer. Um, what is interesting is what they used to call him. And I um, I, this is, I'm just telling you some stuff from, from, uh, from Wikipedia, which, you know, which is fairly accurate in this case. Um, he used to work 15 to 18 hours a day, right? He was well known to be the hardest worker around. And, uh, they used to call him Joey the German and Joey the Jew, just goes to show that even though Pulitzer himself probably identified more as a German than as a Jew, uh, you can never escape your, your Jewish identity and your Jewish heritage. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so as much as he may have wanted to, and I, I do believe he did want to escape his Jewish background, um, he was known as uh, Joey the Jew, sometimes Joey the German, but he was known as the hardest working guy around. Anyway, jumping forward and he's saving money, he's accumulating money. That's the fourth principle of uh, ancient Jewish wisdom that Joseph Pulitzer is employing. Um, he's, uh, you know, straight away, he's not sitting around doing nothing. He's working right away. Um, he accumulates money. He improves himself. He acquires added qualifications and added skills. And um, and he connects with other people and um, bonds with other people and becomes liked and known and trusted by other people. And uh, he then um, takes his money that he's accumulated and he starts buying magazines and publications. And he buys something called the New York World, which at that time he bought it from um, Jay Gould, by the way, the railway guy for whom he had earlier been doing indirectly, he'd been doing legal work. 
and uh, uh, Jay, uh, Jay Gould want imposed very. Uh, I mean, he really Pulitzer desperately wanted to get into the newspaper business, and uh, Gould asked for over half a million dollars, which was a huge sum for the paper, um, as well as he's got to keep the current staff. He can't get his own staff. And um, he was very frustrated with this, but he, he felt pressured and against the wall, and he was willing to accede to those terms. And now we come to the, uh, the last point of ancient Jewish wisdom, his wife. He married and worked on his marriage, and it became a fantastic partnership. His wife's name was Kate, and she said to him, don't do it. Go back to the negotiating table. Uh, Jay Gould wants to sell, otherwise he wouldn't have been talking to you for this long. And he's assuming he can get all his terms. Just put your back against the wall and saying it's not happened. He listened to Kate and got the paper for how much? 300 and less than 350,000 instead of more than half a million. Plus, he retained full freedom in the selection of the staff. So he basically won and was able to do his paper as he wished. Now, at this time, the paper had a relatively small uh, pop, a, a small circulation, but a Pulitzer felt confident that he'd be able to build up the circulation, and, uh, and he did. It went from 15,000 um, to uh, a huge number. Shall I tell you exactly how much? <clears throat> Uh, it started when he bought it, it was about 15,000 readers, and uh, three by three months, it had gone to 40,000 readers. It's incredible. And then it went to 600,000 readers. So Pulitzer, using all these principles, using the principles of ancient Jewish wisdom that, uh, that I teach, uh, in my uh, uh, program, again, at the website, you'll see um, there's a, 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 a downloadable program called the Financial Prosperity Collection, right? You can download it right after the show. And you just go to rabbidaniellappin.com, Financial Prosperity Collection. It's, a, it's an online downloadable program and uh, 10 uh, lessons, 10 video lessons, 10 video, one-hour lessons in applying the principles of ancient Jewish wisdom. And it's, it's beautiful. I love seeing examples such as Joseph Pulitzer uh, deploying these principles so effectively and building himself up uh, a huge empire. Anyways, um, I tell you about Joseph Pulitzer because I just want to tell you an interesting story uh, which has... Uh, a, a, a picture of how things have changed. We're jumping forward, right, uh, from when he bought the, the newspaper. When did he buy the newspaper? Did I tell you the date in which he bought the world? Um, <clears throat> about 1883, 1884 is when it was. Yeah, at any rate, uh, uh, about there. Um in the in the 1880s, the early the early part of the 1880s, um, Pulitzer goes ahead and uh, buys the New York World. Pardon me. You'll forgive me. Um, I just had a drink there, and uh, he he's looking for ways to build up the circulation. So this is just at the very beginning of women being in the workforce. And he, um, he has a young woman, she's 23 years old, on his staff. Her name is Nellie Bly. That's not her real name, that's her pen name. And there's a reason for that, but that's not part of this story. And um, she proposes to him, here's a way to build up circulation. Uh, what we do is you send me. And she starts saying, I've just finished reading H.G. Wells' a wonderful book, Around the World in 80 Days. And um, it, by the way, wonderful movie. Um, you're looking for a movie you can show with your young kids that everybody will enjoy? 
Around the World in 80 Days. David Niven playing the hero Phileas Fogg. And uh, you've got to watch it to the end because it has a surprise ending. And it's it's a wonderful movie. It's been, you know, it's an old movie. But then, as you know, I would never recommend for you. I don't sell, I don't often recommend uh, any movie that is newer than the 1960s, right? The early 1960s. Uh, that's when things began to go downhill in every, almost every area in America. So um, Nellie Bly uh, suggests send me a lady journalist to, to go around the world in 80 days, and, um, and I'll send back dispatches regularly. <laughs> so would you believe it? Uh, they go for it. At the same time, there's a publication in New York called The Cosmopolitan, nothing to do with Cosmo magazine today. And uh, the Cosmopolitan had a young woman working for them called Elizabeth Bisland, and also about the same age. And she goes to her editors, or they go to her, I don't remember. Uh, and, and by the way, this is all in a book called 80 Days, Nellie Bly and Elizabeth Bisland's History-Making Race Around the World. And, um, you know, again, not saying you have to read it, but I become familiar with these things to tell you about them and to save you time so is that uh, you can get the um, some of the most interesting points that are brought out without actually having to <laughs> go ahead and um, uh, read through the whole thing. Anyway, uh, Elizabeth Bisland sets off and she's determined to beat Nellie Bly. They set off at about the same time. Elizabeth Bisland goes towards the West. So she crosses the United States, crosses over towards Japan, goes through Asia, goes through Europe, uh, crosses the Atlantic and gets back to New York. Meanwhile, Nellie Bly goes the other way. She first of all goes through Europe, uh, goes through the Mediterranean, through Egypt, and then uh, to Ceylon and through Asia. And then finally, um, uh, uh, takes a ship to San Francisco and then makes her way cross country back to New York, and she she actually beats the challenger Elizabeth Bisland by a few days. But uh, here's the part I want to tell you that uh, uh, thank you, David. By the way, a tip of the hat to a regular listener who um, who was so struck he brought to my attention this fact that when Nellie Bly left, we know what she took with her. Uh, she took one suitcase, and we're talking about this was 1889, okay, six years after uh, Joseph Pulitzer had bought the world, uh, Nellie Bly sets off to go around the world in 80 days and succeeds, but the main thing I wanted to tell you was what she takes with her, one suitcase and passport, no, you don't need passports, there was freedom, you could travel anywhere you liked, she didn't have to take that. Uh, just some basic clothing and, of course, her notepads. She's going to send back dispatches from her journey constantly. And, yes, it worked. It raised the readership of the of the globe, excuse me, of the world, um, much more even than had been. I mean, she was wildly successful. People loved it. And the idea that it was a race really caught people. It just it was one of those things. Remember, uh, 1889, we don't have radio. We certainly don't have television. Um, even telephones don't yet exist. So, you know, think about newspapers were hugely important in the lives of people and what was going on. So um, here it was, Nellie Bly's story and Elizabeth Bisland's story for the Cosmopolitan. Everybody thrived. And here's the best part. Uh, Nellie Bly um, is music, shall I take a gun? So first of all, be aware that she could have had a gun. Nobody, I mean, in New York City, a young woman, she could have had a gun. And she may have had one. The only question is whether she'd take it on her trip. And she's going really light. She's, I mean, it's amazing how little she took. Uh, and then she says, no, I don't need to take a gun because wherever I'll be, there are going to be men around and men will always come to my defense if anybody starts up with me. How's that, my friends, for a picture of how America has changed? No, how the world has changed. Um, it's uh, it's not that long ago, is it? 1889, uh, so, uh, you know, 130, 140 years ago. And um, we talk about uh, freedom today and the Western democracies and so on. 1889, a young woman could travel around the world confident that men would take care of her and that she could have taken a gun, 
but she decided not to, and she didn't need a passport. That is what it was like. Um, in uh, 1965, I think it was, there was a very big, Was no, it might have been a bit earlier. It was in the early 60s, maybe maybe i'm sorry i should have checked this before and it doesn't matter if you're interested in the date you can find it out but somewhere in the early 1960s there was a huge power outage in new york and uh, new york was dark the whole night there was no electricity and um, no rioting no looting no crime no rise in crime whatsoever as recently as 1963 four, five, somewhere there um nothing by 11 or 12 years later, uh, in 1973, was it, uh, there was a, another power outage, the same kind of thing, where the, you know, huge power outage, and not only New York City, but part of New York State went dark, but the whole of New York City did, and it was a night of terrifying looting and crime and destruction and assault, murder. You know how I always talk about Everything changed in the early 60s. I like saying 1962, but I mean, obviously, epochs don't change on a day or even on a year. But it was a period, right? Say 1960 to 1970, maybe 1965. During that period, huge changes in America, mostly revolving around the uh, elimination of a faith-based view of the world. That's what vanishes. Up till that point... Uh, America sees itself as largely a Christian nation. Doesn't mean everybody was a Christian, but everyone agreed that Judeo-Christian values informed society. People try to make decisions on that basis. They didn't make their decisions based on sentiment. They didn't make their decisions based on what they felt like doing. They built their decisions on values, on the enduring values that was part of what being an American was all about. And that vanishes and goes away, and everything starts deteriorating uh, in, in this amazingly short period of time. So these two power blackouts really give you a very good example of how they bracket this period of change. Um, something else that happened is that talking about Nellie Bly, uh, working in 1889, uh, for the uh, for the world newspaper and Elizabeth Brislin working for the Glow uh, for the Cosmopolitan, but um, round about that time uh, there was a restaurant that began for working people in New York. It was called the Exchange Buffet, and the way it worked was that you went in and you could take whatever you wanted to eat from the shelves. It was a sort of self service, and each item had a price next to it, and then when you'd finished you would uh, go ahead and uh, total up the amount. Then you'd go to the cashier and say, uh, um, I had this, this, and this. The amount is this, is here's the money. It was on a, on a system. If I tell you that, what year do you think Exchange Buffet went bankrupt and out of business? Right, early 60s. That's right. Because up till that time, people, and by the way, the company went public, it was thriving, totally operating on the honor system come in have a quick uh, lunch you know working guy got to get back to whatever you're doing and uh, you just grab the food you like you stand at a table standing tables you 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 eat it and then you uh, you total up how much you eat you go pay the cashier but you could have eaten anything and told the cashier anything but nobody did starting in the early 60s um, they started losing money and it was clear they knew exactly what was going on. But if they had to hire a lot of people to monitor that or to, uh, or, or to redesign their systems, that was also not going to work. You know, a, a major change to a business model is not easy to impose. So uh, exchange buffet restaurants went out of business at exactly this time. And who knows how many other kind of businesses also went under because they had been depending on integrity and honor in the general population. Could you imagine such a restaurant being open today in America, in the United Kingdom, right? I don't think so. Wouldn't work. So I just, 
uh, I want you to be aware of how times have changed, seriously changed, and, uh, and that it's been a steady decline. We've been going downhill since the 1960s. And, um, and that doesn't mean that you can't have a good life. It doesn't mean you can't have a, a good family and a marriage. It doesn't mean you can't raise good kids. It doesn't mean that you can't make a good living and make money. It's harder in a society that's not functioning well. It is harder. There's no question about it. It just means you have to apply the timeless truths that I teach you more meticulously, more um, consistently, and more effectively. That's all. So let's be aware of things that are going on that are not ideal. Let's be aware that these things are happening and uh, we can even plan for them. We can even build them into our strategic planning. Now, I told you last week um, a great deal about why it is very likely that China will absorb Taiwan into greater China within the next little while, you know, within the next one, two, maybe three years, um, sooner rather than later. And I discussed that in great detail last week's show. Um, I just want to now point out that the theme continues. You see, when something keeps showing up in the news, as the Germans used to say, it's in the Zeitgeist. It's in the mood of the moment. There's a reason for that. And so when I tell you something on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, not to pat myself on the back or to say, see, I, I, I told you so. No, I, I just want you to be aware that I'm not using my genius, which doesn't exist. I'm not using my brilliance and all my experience, because none of that is worth anything. But I am applying the principles of ancient Jewish wisdom. Uh, I mentioned last week that power is more useful than paper. And so paper agreements between nations, uh, not going to tell you nearly as much about what's going on as relative power will tell you what's going on. Uh, China is arriving at a position of power, and that's why they laugh. You know, United States obsessing with uh, critical race theory, China laughs. America obsessed with climate change, and Bi Biden, the president, crows with pride that he has got um, the head of China, President Xi, to agree to come to a climate conference. But we'll see who gets what at the climate conference. One thing is for sure, and that is that uh, China is not about to cut back their economic development because um, President Joseph Biden is willing to destroy American economic strength in the pursuit of climate justice. Not going to happen. So, uh, uh, I would to just tell you a little bit about the sort of things that have been showing up, if you don't mind, if that's all right, because that will help to, uh, to show exactly what's going on. So let's look at show. Again, I'm just, I'm grabbing two papers, all right? It's, it's, it, there's a lot of this stuff. Um, this is Wall Street Journal. Um, Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. And uh, here's the story, okay? Um, China's fishing fleet powers Beijing's global ambitions. See, so even something as innocuous as, hey, let's go fishing, in China, nothing is innocuous. Everything is focused on building China into the dominant force for the coming century. Be clear about that. So let me read you a little bit of, uh, of this story. And I'm just jumping from place to place. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But the Chinese fishing fleet is helping the country stake out a bigger presence at sea. So you thought that the fishing fleet is just about fishing. It isn't. They may be fishing, but they're also helping the larger purpose of China's growing dominance. 
Uh, so the Chinese fishing fleet is helping the country stake out a bigger presence at sea, including by building a worldwide network of ports. The vessels can be twice as large as a naval patrol boat at an average of about 200 feet long. That's a pretty big fishing boat. A fishing crews have helped establish island settlements in waters subject to territorial disputes with neighbors. So what they're talking about here is that uh, fishermen, instead of coming back to mainland China constantly, they set up settlements and they move their wives and families to some contested island, uh, maybe an island that belongs to the Philippines or belongs to uh, Japan, and that nobody's actually on, but China starts putting their people there. And when there is a protest from the Philippines or from Japan, China sends naval boats there to protect Chinese citizens. Makes sense, right? You've got, to, you've got to see what's going on. Um, China is operating about 17,000 fishing boats outside their own territorial waters. 17,000. Let's move to page 812. <clears throat> The next biggest fishing fleets after China's 17,000 boats are Taiwan and South Korea. Between them, uh, they have uh, 2,500 vessels. China, 17,000. The next biggest fleets, um, Taiwan and Korea, 2,500. Um, it's pretty amazing. Now, as to how China... And makes agreements. This is so predictable. It's so standard. Uh, you could have told them. I could have told them. But America was so excited when the World Trade Organization, right, the WTO, got China to agree to cap its number of fishing vessels at 3,000. <laughs> I'm sure they did agree. And their position is, so what are you going to do about it? They, they promised in 2017, yeah, we're going to reduce it to uh, no more than uh, 3,000 ships. They've actually got 17,000, no reduction in sight. So what's the World Trade Organization going to do about it? I'm not comparing China to Nazi Germany, but uh, Hitler, when told that the Vatican opposed, no, it wasn't Hitler, I'm so sorry, it was actually Stalin. Uh, Russia, Stalin was told that the um, uh, that the um, uh, um, that uh, what his name um, that uh, the the Pope opposed um, his uh, opposed his, some step he was taking in World War Two. Stalin famously said, uh, "And how many army divisions does the Pope have?" Right, meaning, what are you going to do about it? Uh, China's position is exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the meeting, we said we'll agree to cap our fishing fleet at 3,000. We actually are maintaining a fishing fleet of 17,000, and they are part of our expansion plans. What are you going to do about it? And what is the answer of the West? Well, uh, nothing, uh, nothing. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's where we are today, you know. We just better acknowledge it. Um, uh, Chairman Xi, the head of China, um, calls, he said he insists on developing uh, 29 distant water fishing bases. Do you know what that means? Right, who can object to a, a distant fishing base? But those are not just fishing bases because everybody in China is unified by the Communist Party and the Communist Party makes sure that everybody is keeping their eyes on the main objective. And the main objective is the growth of Greater China. And so um, they're going to build 29 fishing bases, but they're going to be in locations that will help project Chinese power. Because obviously a Chinese fishing base is just another word for a Chinese colony, <laughs> which the Chinese Navy, and I'll tell you more about the Chinese Navy in a moment, will protect um, in um, one of those bases has already been built in Mauritania in West Africa and um, 
China is already starting to use that as a naval base. Hello? <laughs> you just, just be aware of these things. And be aware that you won't hear about this from the popular media. The media is obsessed with making Russia the big danger to the world. No, that's just to avoid having to focus on China, partially because everybody is in China's pocket. Um, during the course of the election, before the end of it all, we all became aware of President Biden's son's deep involvement with China and the huge amount of money. Um, hundreds and hundreds, probably in excess of $800 million, funneling from China to the Biden family. That was the information we were getting during the uh, latter stages of the election campaign. Um, obviously, nobody wants to rock the boat with China. And so um, just, again, to be aware, I also told you last week that uh, in the last couple of years, about a billion dollars Chinese money to American universities. Um, over 300,000 uh, Chinese people studying at American universities. So, yeah, look, um, the elite, the governing elite in America do not want to rock the boat with China. Be aware of that as well. A few more things from the story. Uh, the Chinese Navy, Coast Guard and paramilitary often join fishermen in motorboats in regional seas where China has built artificial islands with military-capable facilities, including airstrips, fighters, jet hangars, and naval bases. Now, I don't know if you heard about this over the last year or so from anywhere else uh, but from me here. You may have if you're interested and you searched for it and you delved into it, but generally speaking, if your news source, and I know it isn't for happy warriors, but if your news source is mainstream media, well, you're not going to uh, find out about how much expansion, military expansion, China has made in the South China Sea, and they are aided in this by their fishing fleet, obviously. Uh, Vietnam, Vietnam said that a Chinese military vessel sank a Vietnamese fishing boat in April 2020, just about a year ago, uh, near the Paracel Islands, which both nations claim, both Vietnam and China. Who are you going to put your money on? Who do you think gets control of those islands, China or Vietnam? Well, let me think. <laughs> uh, come on. Yeah, uh, you've got to, got to be a bit intelligent about this. Um, and uh, uh, off, out in Ghana, Ghana has been upset because China has been fishing, again, with huge fleets of these enormous fishing vessels uh, within Ghana territorial waters. And uh, uh, Chinese fishing boats ignore Ghanaian protests, and they just carry on and fish away. Uh, a modern Chinese fishing vessel takes 700 tons of fish a day. That's a lot of fish. A volume that would take the largest Ghanaian fishing vessel six months. Right now, 700 tons in itself is an absolute number. You and I have no idea, like, is that a lot or a little? But if we tell you that a Ghanaian fishing boat takes 600, excuse me, takes six months to harvest 700 tons, a Chinese vessel does it in one day. That gives you an idea of what is going on. Um, China is dominating fishing completely. Um, Ghana's fishing output last year is around $480 million, but it's a fraction of its $7.3 billion annual trade with China, oil, metals, etc. So um, Ghana is a little bit reluctant to make too much of a fuss because China has so much power um, they could just immediately uh, pull the plug, pull the plug on um, Ghana's trade. They wouldn't want to do that. Um, I said I would tell you one other thing about the naval capabilities, and indeed I'm going to do just that. <coughs> Let me do that. And uh, <coughs> uh, same issue of the Wall Street Journal. As I said, um, the uh, it was April... The date of this journal was uh, April, what did I say? Uh, April 22nd. 
And here's here's the piece. Um, okay, this has to do with shipyards. You remember when I spoke about Bitcoin, I told you about relative strength in America and China in the production of aluminum. Well, pardon me. Now we're looking at shipyards. And uh, uh, for years, I'm quoting from the Wall Street Journal, for years there's been a consensus that the U.S. Navy should grow to 356 ships. At the moment, it doesn't have 300. They need more than 350. They don't have 300. So, uh, uh, but for that, you need shipyards to build and maintain the vessels. And uh, US, the United States used to have 10 large Navy yards with dry docks and repair facilities. They used to have 10. How many now? There are four. There are four shipyards that the United States Navy has. One is in Hawaii. One is in the state of Maine. One is in Virginia. And one is in Washington state. Those are the only four shipyards, down from 10. And uh, those, apparently, are not sufficient to even do the maintenance necessary on the existing naval force of less than 300 ships. There simply is not enough capacity to expand the fleet, which is why the Navy has not grown even as its budget has expanded. Everybody agrees we need more ships. The Congress has assigned more money to the Navy, and yet they, they, they don't have, they need 350 plus, they don't have 300. So we're short about 60 ships right now. <clears throat> um, the uh, Burke class destroyer has fallen 12 months behind schedule, right? Right, this is a destroyer that's supposed to be being built 12 months behind. Maintenance is even further behind. Listen to this. This, is, uh, this absolutely blew my mind. Uh, the USS Boise, a fast attack submarine, was scheduled to start maintenance in 2015. That is six years ago from when I'm taping this program. And it was supposed to have maintenance done on it at the Navy shipyard in Norfolk, Virginia. But Norfolk was backed up with other maintenance, and eventually the submarine was moved to a commercial yard in nearby Newport News. The delay ate up more than three years, or about 10% of the ship's service life. So the ship's projected to have a 30-year service life. So far, three years wasted because they haven't been able to get on with the maintenance. It's quite unbelievable. Over the next few years, more than 50 ships need to be retired. They've reached the point where they're just too old. So now uh, we are at about uh, 350 ships that uh, we, excuse me, we have 296 ships. We don't have 300. It's going to go to 250. And what we really need is more than 350, with absolutely no chance whatsoever of building them. Now, most of the global shipbuilding is in where? You guessed it, China, obviously. Most of the shipbuilding, the, the global shipbuilding capacity is located in China. South Korea has some, Japan and Europe. China, now here's the numbers again. I told you how many shipyards we have that are capable of doing the work for. Here's how many China has, 1,000. China has 1,000 shipyards, the biggest of which can produce as much tonnage as the entire U.S. shipbuilding base. So one, only one out of 1,000 shipyards in China can, is, has the capacity of all the American shipyards together. Now, it doesn't mean that all of the shipyards in China are the same size, but it gives you an idea of how out of balance things are right now. Okay, so when I talk about America being in decline, I say it sadly, but at the same sense, I'm not going to be silly and I'm not going to lie to you. Oh, don't worry, we're a democracy, so we're always going to be OK. Uh, no, it doesn't exactly work that way. Economic power 
industrial power, military power, actually matter, and they matter a great deal. By the way, I should also tell you that, uh, in my view, Hitler could easily have won World War II. All he had to do was stop early, and he would have had huge additions to his territory. He would have had Czechoslovakia and Austria and Poland, he would have, and the Western democracies would have been so happy to cease the war that were it not for Churchill, um, had, Ch had Hitler reached out and said, you know what, let's have peace. I don't think Churchill would have been able to stop the, the outcry for peace. Remember, you, uh, England and France didn't have the gumption to stop Hitler violating the Versailles Treaty and the Locarno Treaty by marching into the Rhineland in 1936. I told you about that last week. They certainly would have been happy. Hitler would have emerged as one of the greatest statesmen in history uh, with very little bloodshed. He's expanded his territory, dominates Europe. Uh, democracies are going to win because they're democracies. Please, my friends, above all, let's try and study together how the world really works, okay? Um, so this piece finishes, America's industrial base is not meeting the minimal peacetime demands placed upon it. If Mr. Biden is serious about infrastructure, he better pay attention to this. All right, so that's, that's pretty important. Um, in uh, the Wall Street Journal of Friday, April the 23rd, 2021, big headline, Taiwan's defense levels stoke concerns. <laughs> right? What are they saying? Well, we don't think that Taiwan has got the ability to prevent Chinese aggression. <laughs> Hello, yes. I, I think that's true by a big, by a big margin. Um, right, so, um, or again, this article makes absolutely clear, please, Taiwan, don't for a moment think that the United States is going to come to your assistance in the event of Chinese aggression. Not going to happen. China has about 100 times as many uh, army personnel as Taiwan. 100 times! And uh, their, China's military budget, 25 times larger than Taiwan. That kind of tells you, doesn't it? What's there to talk about? Treaties? Paper? Promises? That's not how it works. Um, so, uh, General Li Hizimin, chief of the general staff of Taiwan's military until 2019, says, from my perspective, we are really far behind what we need. It's impossible. They can't possibly get what they need. They can't achieve military parity with China. It's impossible. Um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken. I love that name because, uh, as I've said before, uh, we'll see who does the Blinken when the uh, uh, mess hits the fan. And uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said this month, the U.S. was committed to ensuring Taiwan has the ability to defend itself. Do you hear that? Like, what exactly does that mean? Um, Anthony Blinken declined to say what the U.S. would do if China attacked Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame him. Of course he had declined to explain what America would do, because it would be very embarrassing to say zero. Um, anyway, this is a, a major story in the Wall Street Journal. Chi Taiwan's defense level stoke concerns. Uh, let's see, is there anything else here that you need to know about? <clears throat> Let me just see. The annual... I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> oh, here's, here's... This is interesting. <clears throat> um, Taiwan... Uh, has 165,000 active duty military personnel. They used to have 275,000. It's now down to 165,000. So it's a huge drop. Um, what does that tell me? Probably exactly what it tells you, right? Um, means that uh, many young people in China are choosing 
to go and work for Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing rather than serving in the military. That's all. They do not have conscription. And um, they've just seen what's happened to Hong Kong. Are they not worried about China taking over Taiwan? No, I don't think they are worried. Because, like I said, you're not going to see bombs landing on the skyscrapers of Taipei. Taiwei, Taipei, by the way, uh, a lovely city. I mean, it's an extraordinary city. I, I really found it fascinating. Uh, and I enjoyed meeting the people who I, who I lectured to. But um, Taipei going to be, no, nobody's talking about bombing anything. I don't think that's going to happen. And they believe, um, you know, I had a chance to speak to a Hong Kong businessman uh, I met with him on Tuesday of this week, and we had some business to attend to. And then I asked him afterwards, please tell me what's happened to the business community in Hong Kong. And he told me something very interesting. He said, nothing's changed. Yes, China's taken over, but they have no intention of harming the economic climate and the vibrancy of business in Hong Kong. No change taking place there at all. And so um, all that is happening is that Activists, young people who want to be activists, that's the word my Hong Kong friend used, they have trouble. And then he looked at me uh, dolefully and he said, and I, he has a big family, I, I, know he, I knew his father quite well. Uh, he said, some of us have children who are activists and that's problematic. So you get the idea. Um, if you're willing to accept that Hong Kong is now part of China and just carry on doing business, no problem if you're willing to accept that Taiwan is now part of greater China, but that's it. Business continues. Those people, or there will always be people who are idealists and who want freedom in it for whatever reason. Sometimes it's for their own self-aggrandizement. That's very often. You look at Fidel Castro um, and many other freedom fighters and revolutionary leaders. Um, you know, I, I think of Barack Obama that way, by the way. Uh, he, he, he set out at the beginning to wanting to be revolutionary and everything's going to change and, you know, th fine. A part of that is because in that environment, he has a role to play. But in a world where the Barack Obamas have to make a living like anybody else in the marketplace, I'm sorry, I think we're looking at a very, very hungry Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, you have to have skills, like I told you about Joseph Pulitzer using five principles of ancient Jewish wisdom. Uh, yeah, you, you've got to be able to provide something for other people that uh, they can't do for themselves. Anyway, that's that's pretty straightforward. I said that uh, I wanted to tell you about... Um, hmm, all right, I'm, I, I'm going to do this quickly because I don't want the, the show to, to be too long. But um, we're going to talk about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. And the name of his little book is called Memoir on Pauperism. And, and this, by the way, is something, this is a book that um, uh, when I tell you a bit about it, you'll decide if you want to own this book. Uh, I certainly believe it's worth owning and, uh, and um, you might as well. Um, here's just a little quote from the book and I'll give you more. Any measures that establish legal charity on a permanent basis and gives it administrative form, right, setting up a welfare department, thereby creates an idle and lazy class living at the expense of the industrial and working class. Do you just hear that? The man writes this in 1835. He could have been writing it today in England in Germany, in Sweden, in the United States of America, Norway, uh, countries that support a non-working underclass by taking money away from the hard workers. And yes, of course, it's always done in the name of uh, social concern and the poor and taking care of the less fortunate. But Alexis de Tocqueville tells the truth. Um, so I'm getting, I'm just selecting pieces I've prepared that I wanted to share with you. Um, visiting England in 1833, Alexis de Tocqueville was struck by how England, which was the most affluent nation in Europe in 1833, he struck 
by why is it that England has huge numbers of its population on the dole, receiving money from government, which means from taxes, which means from their fellow citizens. And, um, he, you know, this England, prosperous country, and yet a huge prevalence of what he calls pauperism, right? People throwing themselves onto the uh, welfare of their fellows. Um, so... Uh, he says, says Alexis de Tocqueville, let public welfare open a hundred, a thousand, make as many welfare organizations you like. They will all be filled and they will all remain in society um, as many unfortunates who will request permission to enter will claim it as a right if one recognized it as such. Basically, he's saying that when you start handing out money, the line that will form will be of infinite length. Right? When you start handing out money, there will be a line of people that will just keep growing. You'll never be able to get rid of it. Um, uh, so in his book, he starts out by studying human history to figure it out, to figure out why is it that what he calls pauperism, basically people who are willing to... Um, basically not take care of themselves and throw themselves onto the mercies of their fellow citizens. Why is that that arises more in the advanced industrial societies rather than in relatively backwards agrarian? And sure enough, right, in Bangladesh, nothing like, you know, there's not a welfare class. In Ghana, there's not a welfare class. But in United States, United Kingdom, France, Norway, Sweden, huge welfare class, right? He says, well, when you create a welfare administrative um, bureaucracy, it will always have work to do. The number of people coming to it will always grow. So how else should people be taken care of? He says, privately, individuals and churches and private organizations, because those people look after their money. And they make sure it's not being wasted. And they will do everything possible to make sure the recipients do not become permanent recipients. It's so true. You can't go wrong with this stuff. Um, so, so he says that... Um, uh, he says that one of the reasons is that in an industrial society... Um, there are all kinds of goods and services that are being made available that not everybody can have because equality is an inevitable condition of freedom, right? right? When, we, when we give people freedom, then we also give them freedom to be diligent and to work and to apply the biblical principles of wealth creation. We also give them freedom not to do that. So basically, God's deal with his children is that I created angels and they operate on a spiritual plane and they operate on being pre-programmed. Think of them as robots. They're pre-programmed with everything I want them to do, says God. Then I created animals and animals are operate on instinct. In a way, they have a program in them uh, and they operate according to that. Angels don't have choice about what to do. They have to do what God wants them to do. Um, Animals, they don't have choice. They operate an instinct. Animals do what animals do. There's no choice involved. There's only one creature on the planet that was created with choice. And that, my friends, is you and me. Human beings are created with the ability to choose what we want to do. Every minute of the day, you're free to make a new decision. Every day, every hour of your life. You can decide to stop doing destructive things and only do... Now, it's not easy, but you do have the choice. You've got to know that. So God says, I'm giving you freedom of choice. You want to work hard. You want to follow my principles for wealth creation. You will be able to live in prosperity and comfort. But you also have freedom to not go that route. And that means you can live for the present and only do things that are fun and, feel, and that feel good. But the result is you're not going to have money. That's called inequality. It's either freedom or equality. You cannot have both. And Alexis de Tocqueville is very big on freedom. 
I want to, uh, I must read to you uh, just a few lines. I don't normally do this because I believe that uh, listening to somebody read is is essentially boring. But, uh, but here, uh, it, it is so remarkable. I'll just take a drink. So remarkable that you are going to love it. Um, okay, so um, I'm reading. Man, like all socially organized beings, has a natural passion for idleness, right? We've spoken about this many, many times before. Um, our bodies, the, the lower part of us, would like to sit and watch TV and eat uh, chips and drink Pepsi Cola or beer uh, all the time. That's what we'd like to do. Uh, we'd like to engage sexually constantly whenever we feel like it in any way, in any form, with no subsequent consequences of any kind. These are the things that we guys would like to do all the time. Um, there are, however, two incentives to work, the need to live and the desire to improve the conditions of one's life. Says de Tocqueville, experience has proven that the majority of men can be sufficiently motivated to work only by the first of these incentives. Majority of men will only work if the alternative is starving to death. But welfare, obviously, makes it possible to avoid work and avoid starving to death. Got it? The second, namely the desire to improve your life, that's only effective with a small minority of people. Well, a charitable institution indiscriminately open to all those in need, or a law which gives all the poor a right to public aid, whatever the origin of their poverty, weakens or destroys the first stimulant and leaves only the second intact. In other words, there's now no longer any incentive to work to stay alive. And now are these people going to be incentivized to work in order to improve the condition of their lives? He says, not likely. Any measure which establishes legal charity on a permanent basis, called a welfare system, and gives it an administrative form, thereby creates an idle and lazy class living at the expense of the industrial and working class. This, at least, is its inevitable cons consequence, if not the immediate result. Circumstances, as in America, can prevent the seed from developing rapidly, but they cannot destroy it. And if the present, he's talking about welfare being a bad seed planted in society. <clears throat> um, then he speaks about uh, the dangers of telling people they have a right to aid. They have a right to welfare. They have a right to entitlements. They have a right to Section 8 housing. They have a right to food stamps. America did a terrible thing when they changed the words to entitlements. These are various entitlements. Because, he says, you're now creating two classes of people. An inferior class that has a right to being supported and a superior class which takes care of itself. He said, if only it would be left as a charity. You don't have a right to my money, but if I choose to, I can help you. But I'll take care of making sure that my money is used well. That's the difference between private charity and governmental charity. The poor man who demands money in the name of the law is in a still more humiliating position than the indigent who asks pity of his fellow men in the name of he who regards all men from the same point of view, namely the Lord, and who subjects rich and poor to equal laws. This, this is beautiful stuff. <clears throat> and again, hearing me read it is not the same as reading it yourself. <clears throat> He says, uh, legalized charity run by a bureaucratic administrative structure allows uh, the handing over of money to continue, but it removes its morality. The law strips one man of wealth and of a part of his surplus without consulting him, and he sees the poor man only as a greedy, greedy stranger invited by the government to share his wealth. Think about that. A legalized administrative bureaucracy like the welfare system strips productive people of their wealth and of the and of part of the surplus they create 
without asking them and makes us see the poor man only as a greedy stranger invited by government to share our wealth. This is not a good, healthy situation. The poor man feels no gratitude for a benefit which no one can refuse him. Isn't that beautiful? If you've ever wondered why it is that welfare recipients are not the most patriotic of people, right? Welfare recipients in England or in France or in Sweden, they should be the most patriotic Frenchmen or Englishmen or Swedes. They're not. They're resentful. They tend towards the criminal. They help to destroy society. But they're receiving. How can they? The answer is they know you have no choice. It's not as if they feel grateful because you're choosing to be nice to them. You have no choice. Ah, terrible. Terrible. Um, let's just, uh, let me wrap this up with his last and perhaps most important sentence. You want to hear this? It's pretty amazing. He's talking about, he's predicting what will happen to societies who... Uh, build administrative welfare bureaucracies and take money from some people to hand out to other people. He's saying what's good. He understands the tendency. He understands the temptation. He understands why nations do this. But he says, here's what's going to happen. Any permanent, regular, listen to this very carefully, any permanent, regular administrative system whose aim will be to provide for the needs of the poor, which is a nice need, which is a nice goal, will breed more miseries than it can cure, will deprave the population that it wants to help, and will in time reduce the rich to being no more than the tenant farmers of the poor. It will dry up the sources of savings, will stop the accumulation of capital, will retard the development of trade, will benumb human industry and activity, and will culminate by bringing about a violent revolution in the state, when the number of those who receive welfare will have become as large as those who give it, and the indigent no longer being able to take from the impoverished rich the means of providing for their needs, will find it easier to plunder them of all their property at one stroke than to ask for their help. My friends, you'd have thought that Alexis de Tocqueville was living in Minneapolis, 2021. You'd think he was living in Birmingham, England. You'd think he was living in the towns of Sweden and Norway and France that are dominated by recipients of welfare. Please allow me to wrap up today's show um, a little bit later than I wanted to, but nonetheless, by reading that last paragraph one more time from Alexis de Tocqueville, um, who is writing in a book called Memoir on Pauperism, <clears throat> any permanent, regular, administrative system whose aim will be to provide for the needs of the poor will breed more miseries than it can cure will deprave the population. Well, what would you call the recipients of welfare in England today? Not depraved? Um, it will breed more miseries than it can cure. It will deprave the population that it wants to help and comfort. Will in time reduce the rich to being no more than the tenant farmers of the poor. Will dry up the sources of savings, will stop the accumulation of capital, will retard the development of trade, will benumb human industry and activity, and will culminate by bringing about a violent revolution in the state when the number of those who receive welfare will have become as large as those who give it, and the indigent no longer being able to take from the impoverished rich the means of providing for their needs will find it simply easier to just plunder them of all their property at one stroke than to ask for their help. My goodness, that is just about where we are. And when did the entire welfare industry launch and become the monster that it is today? Yeah, that's right, the 1960s. Early 1960s is when it all began. 
So that, my friends, brings us to as far as we can go in today's Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. Know that I remain solemnly committed to helping you know how the world really works. And that's what we've been doing today. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope that you will have a chance to share it with other people. I love that. And I hope that you will have a chance to visit uh, the website, if you don't mind, rabbidaniellappin.com, uh, right there. Uh, and um, what I would love you to do is go to the About Us uh, section and contact us. Let me hear from you. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, love to know what your response is to some of these ideas and how you're dealing with things. Um, please make sure you also um, get your free ebook the holistic you that shows how we are made up in totality of these five fundamental elements our faith our family our finance our fitness and our friendships and uh, how to build all of these simultaneously all of that in the free ebook the holistic you i also would like you to take a look at an online program for those of you who are bible centric for those of you who know how much can be extracted from uh, the Bible viewed through the lens of ancient Jewish wisdom. Uh, again, at rabbidaniellappin.com, you will be able to look for something called scrolling through scripture. Uh, it'll blow you away. I mean, if, uh, if you've ever been astounded at um, why it takes five hours to study the first 30 verses of Genesis, well, that's what you want to do. If you've ever been puzzled um, at some of the wording in those first, actually, 34 verses, uh, you would want to look at scrolling through Scripture. If you want to read more about that program, also head over to rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, please go ahead and read about scrolling through Scripture. Until next week, my friends, thank you for being part of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Without you, I wouldn't be doing this, and I really do enjoy doing this, but I only do it because I know that you are there, and I know you're there because of the comments you submit and the letters you write and the email you send, all of which are enormously valuable. So until next week, I want to wish you a week of good times of happiness and throwing yourself into the fight to improve your family, yes, your faith, your finances, your friendships, and your physical fitness. Until next week, I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. God bless.